Greetings YouTubers and welcome to the Gearbench. This video is part four in a series on performance nutrition for backpackers. I recommend you watch the series in order as each episode makes reference to topics discussed previously. However, this discussion most closely follows part three which was on hydration strategies. While that video addressed issues regarding the drinking of water itself, this one will attempt to tackle the tightly interwoven topic of electrolyte balance. Links to the series are in the description box below. As I've mentioned before, any attempt to quantify factors that involve people with all their glorious differences will necessarily be affected not only by interpretation, but by a healthy amount of uncertainty. So sticking to my format, I will do my best to present everything herein through the lens of published scientific articles and studies, the references for which I will show as we go so you can double check or read further as desired. I managed to get through an entire video on hydration without explicitly mentioning the three different ways of being dehydrated. And that's because the differences have to do with your electrolyte concentrations. So let's talk about it now. If you haven't been drinking enough water to replace your losses, dehydration can result. The state of dehydration can be classified into one of three categories. Isotonic, hypertonic, or hypotonic. And recalling your high school chemistry, osmosis is the movement of water through a semi-permeable membrane like a cell wall. It goes from a solution with lower tonicity to one with a higher tonicity where tonicity is just the ability of a solution to attract water across that membrane. Things that increase the tonicity of solutions and thus osmosis are called osmotically active substances. In the extracellular fluid, which for our purposes here includes primarily your blood plasma, sodium is the main osmotically active substance. In other words, sodium, amongst all the other electrolytes, is the primary driver of fluid balance within your body. Right, so getting back to the types of dehydration. Technically, it's possible to be isotonically dehydrated, and that would mean that you had lost proportionally the same amount of water and sodium from your body, and thus your fluid concentrations of sodium and therefore tonicity wouldn't change, leaving overall water balance unaffected, albeit now in a dehydrated state. But sweat is hypotonic, and that means that when you sweat, you're losing more water than sodium in proportion to what's inside your body. Simplifying things, though sweat may seem salty to the taste, your blood is saltier still. So, as you hike in the heat, all that sweat wicking rapidly through your miraculous microfiber attire is depleting you of water faster than sodium. And this means that even though you're losing sodium and not taking in any salt at all, the concentration of sodium in your body is rising and rising. And this situation leads to the second type to be discussed, hypertonic dehydration. I developed a visual analogy to help explain what's going on. I just like playing with toys. Now, the blue chips represent water. Not a molecule of water, but an unspecified portion of water. And the white cubes represent portions of sodium. And even though they're reminiscent of grains of salt, remember that salt and sodium are not the same thing. Say for the sake of this analogy that your normal plasma concentration is three portions of water for every portion of sodium. Once again, these aren't molecules or milligrams or any other specific measure. They're just suppositional ratios for the purposes of illustration. Just an analogy. Okay, in our diagram here, the lower part represents inside your body, and the upper part is the great outdoors. And this line is your skin's surface. I added some arm hairs just, you know, to make it real. And here's all your water and sodium inside showing a eu-hydrated state in electrolyte balance. And these aren't bonded to each other, they're in free solution. I just group them a bit to make the ratio more visually obvious. So now let's see what happens when you sweat. As represented in our analogous scheme, the natural saltiness in your body is three water portions to every one of sodium. As mentioned, however, sweat is hypotonic, and this means it's less salty than your body's resting ratio. So in our analogy, we'll define one helping of sweat as five portions of water for every one of sodium. Then we just act out what happens as you continue to sweat on the trail. Let's say that after a period of time, you've wicked away your first serving of sweat. 
We remove five waters and one sodium from the body. Over the span of another period, you continue to evaporate another like measure. Now look what's happening to the sodium levels inside your body. You've been losing sodium through sweat and not taking in any new salt through diet, so your absolute sodium count has been dropping. But you've been losing water even faster, so while total sodium amount has decreased, the net sodium concentration has been rising. And as you can see, we went from three waters per sodium in the body now down to just two. Again, these exact ratios are just for illustration purposes only. Now, also in this scenario, we've just been sweating, not eating or drinking. This combination of water deprivation and excessive sweating leads to hypertonic dehydration, which in turn results in hypernatremia. The increased concentration of sodium in your extracellular fluid, where your sweat comes from, renders it hypertonic compared to intracellular levels. And this osmotically attracts water out of your body cells, causing cell shrinkage, which may include a significant shrinkage of the brain cells. If severe enough, this can result in death. Using our analogy again really quick, say this is a body cell, and over here we have an area of the extracellular fluid. Now, to start, both sides are osmotically at rest, with our baseline of three waters to every sodium. But as we sweat, however, we end up rendering the extracellular space into a greater concentration of sodium. By the rules of osmosis, water from the lower concentrated cells wants to flow into the extracellular space where sodium concentration is now higher. And this dehydrates your cells like raisins and can lead to the aforementioned trouble with your brain. So, what are the implications of all this in terms of best practices in the field? Obviously, number one is don't dehydrate. But for the purposes of this particular issue, let's assume you've run out of drinkable water. Maybe the water source you anticipated is dry, or your treatment method is broken, or your container was lost or damaged. Whatever the reason, you're now faced with marching onward without a drop to drink. Continued evaporative loss is inevitable. Even on a cool day where sweat may be minimal, you still lose moisture through your skin and breath. And without water, hypernatremia looms imminently, though admittedly it could be many hours away unless you're sweating measurably. In circumstances like these, it may be advisable to limit sodium intake. Normally, the emphasis is on electrolyte replacement to compensate for losses from sweat, but that presumes you're taking fluids as well. If you are experiencing water deprivation, however, you're already beginning to brine your insides with that increased concentration of sodium. Eating something salty may just serve to accelerate the problem and make your situation worse. Okay, but hopefully a water deprivation scenario is a rare mistake. Normally you should have adequate access to potable H2O. So what happens when you sweat significantly but you are taking in water? As discussed in part three on hydration strategies, ad libitum drinking, where you drink to thirst, doesn't fully replace losses. Over time, this can lead to our third type, hypotonic dehydration. Because sweat is both water and sodium, if you replace it with only water, your sodium levels will keep dropping. And eventually you can develop hyponatremia, which, as discussed previously, doesn't just lead to performance problems, it can be fatal. And this can happen even if your fluid replacement is less than 100% of losses. Essentially, you can end up dehydrated and hyponatremic at the same time. The article on dehydration types puts it succinctly. Hypernatremia is a result of dehydration. Hyponatremia is not a result of dehydration, but a result of treatment of dehydration with fluids that do not contain enough sodium. In his article entitled The Math of Salt Loss, Dr. Jonathan Toker states, there is no doubt that to participate in an 8 to 17 hour event, one must take on board some calories, fluid, and electrolytes to offset at least some of that which is consumed or lost during the event. It seems to him, however, that electrolytes, in particular sodium, are not as widely recognized as being a similar need to water and calories. He argues that electrolytes are a regular part of athletic expenditure and should be as routinely attended to as energy and fluid. He also points out, 
No immediately available repository of sodium has yet been reported discovered in any tissue or organ within the body to date. So, unlike energy, where you're carrying around from 30 to 50,000 spare calories in body fat, you have no effective sodium reserves, and what you lose, you'll need to replace as you go. And the only practical way to do that in the field is by consuming foods, supplements, or drink mixes that contain electrolytes. To illustrate the math of salt loss, Dr. Toker constructed a mathematical model to show progressive levels of hydration and sodium concentration over a theoretical 10-hour event. And for his example, he used a sweat rate of 1 liter per hour and a sweat sodium content of 920 milligrams per liter. Now, based on our previous estimations, it's probably high for hiking level exertion, unless you're really in a hurry and it's a very warm day. But the 10 hour length of his theoretical event applies well enough to a day of backpacking, which could be even longer. And he points out the example, demonstrates very clearly what can go wrong for athletes walking a marathon and drinking water to replace all fluid loss. Hyponatremia will result and has caused death at events around the world for exactly this reason called water intoxication. The first scenario involves three examples of rehydration, all of which do not involve any level of sodium supplementation. In timeline number one, there is no fluid consumption. This is the sweating plus water deprivation setting discussed earlier. After just two hours, plasma sodium content has become dangerously hypernatremic. And note that your thirst drive will kick in before this happens, so it's not necessarily a likely situation, except in the case of forced dehydration, such as when your waters run out and you must keep going. In timeline number two, the subject is drinking to replace 50% of fluid loss. In this situation, the individual maintains fairly normal plasma volume and sodium content for three hours. However, by the fourth hour, dehydration has entered the range where performance becomes impacted and sodium content reaches dangerously high levels. By hour seven, dehydration is verging on dangerous as well. This illustrates how you can become dehydrated and hypernitremic at the same time. And in timeline number three, our NPC drinks to replace 100% of fluid loss, but still no sodium intake. While this is an effective strategy to prevent dehydration, it is clear that hyponatremia begins as soon as two hours and at a dangerous level, by four hours. This is the situation that is still killing the occasional marathon runner. As discussed in part three, even experienced supervised individuals can mistake the onset of hyponatremia for the symptoms of heat stress. And this can lead you to drink even more thinking that's the solution when in fact it only aggravates the problem. All right, so that was three ways to do it wrong without taking in any sodium. Obviously not drinking at all leads to trouble. But the takeaway there should be to note that even if you drink all the way up to a 100% of fluid loss, without sodium replacement, you won't last. Sodium, however, is an example of the need for proper balance. Whether it's too much or too little, both can be bad for you. And Dr. Toker's second set of scenarios involves various combinations of fluid replacement coupled with different amounts of sodium supplementation. In timeline number four, our same hypothetical athlete again drinks to replace 100% of fluid loss, but this time they also supplement with 400 milligrams of sodium per hour. Remember though that the model assumes a sweat sodium loss of 920 milligrams per hour, so this supplement is less than half of what is being lost. Previously in timeline number three, 100% water without sodium led to red line hyponatremia by hour four. This time, full fluids with partial sodium helps, but only prolongs the inevitable. However, over time, the sodium loss exceeds that which is consumed, and the plasma begins to dilute, causing severe hyponatremia by six hours. Timeline number five looks at 75% fluid replacement with 1,000 milligrams per hour of sodium, which is more than is being sweated away. In this example, the athlete avoids redlining hydration. However, Due to the excessive sodium consumption, severe hypernatremia will occur by four hours. This athlete is taking in too much salt. They will likely become very thirsty and increase their fluid consumption. And lastly, there's timeline number six, where 90% of water and 700 milligrams per hour, or 76% of sodium is replaced. And this allows the athlete to keep everything in the green for the full 10 hours. And it didn't take perfect 100% replacement scheme to do it. As I suggested in the part three video regarding dehydration levels, it's not only about avoiding death or a serious medical condition, it's about feeling healthy and doing well. 
as Dr. Toker puts it, this athlete will be the most likely to perform and not just survive. In summary, extended periods of exercise at even moderate intensity can cause significant losses of fluid through sweating. Electrolytes, including sodium, potassium, magnesium, and calcium, are present in this sweat at levels that over time will cause your body to become depleted. You must drink to avoid dangerous levels of dehydration, but consumption of water will act to further dilute remaining electrolyte reserves and can exacerbate symptoms, even to the point of death. So the only solution is to drink while supplementing with electrolytes. All right, so apart from all the Grim Reaper stuff of severe cases, what are the performance issues involved in more routine levels of electrolyte depletion? Let's start with sodium, the electrolyte lost in greatest amounts per liter of sweat. Spanish researchers published this study in the Scandinavian Journal of Medicine and Science in Sports. In it, they separated triathletes performing a half Ironman into two groups. The groups were matched for age and experience. Group 1 drank the sports drinks they normally consumed during a race, and of note, this only replaced 20% of the sodium they lost. Group 2 drank their usual rehydration drinks as well, but they also supplemented that with salt capsules to replace 71% of the sodium lost through sweat. And the results? Even though the sports drink only group had better times previously in a half Ironman, the salt supplementing group ended up finishing the race an average 26 minutes faster. This positive effect on performance relates to an increase in the concentration of electrolytes in the blood, making them drink more fluids during the race, as salt stimulates thirst, and improves the water and electrolyte balances during the competition. Next up, Dr. Toker again with an article on the importance of potassium. Now, recalling your high school biology, the sodium-potassium pump is what allows nerve cells to transmit signals. And in muscles, those signals control contraction. Running the pump while short of ingredients can affect physical performance. Simply, this means a lack of potassium will slow down or halt nerve and muscle action. Potassium deficiency symptoms include nausea, slower reflexes, vomiting, muscle weakness, muscle spasms, cramping, and rapid heart rate. But potassium is important for another reason involving energy metabolism, and if you've been following the video series, you'll know why this caught my eye. Potassium is stored in muscle fibers along with glycogen. It plays a critical role in helping transport glucose into the muscle cell. No, no. Don't mess with the glycogen. When glycogen breaks down to supply energy for your workouts, muscle cells are depleted of potassium. And this puts a greater concentration of potassium in your blood, which provides the fluid for sweat. And as such, burning glycogen will cause an increase in potassium loss through sweating. And this makes supplementation during prolonged exercise a potential issue. Potassium loss averages from 100 to 200 milligrams per hour during activity, but Dr. Toker suggests that 75 to 150 milligrams per hour is adequate replenishment amount for an average adult. He says replacing it all at once can alter optimum sodium balance and too much potassium is hard on the stomach. If you let yourself run too low, studies have shown that potassium deficiency can be responsible for muscle injury. Onward to magnesium. This study by the U.S. Department of Agriculture looked at postmenopausal women in a depletion-repletion experiment. They took 10 women aged 45 to 71. For an initial control period of 35 days, the women consumed diets containing 112 milligrams of magnesium, plus they took a 200 milligram daily supplement. Then, for the next 93 days, they gave up the supplements and consumed only the diet. This was the depletion phase. And finally, there was a repletion phase with a return to both diet and supplement for another 49 days. And a number of changes were discovered in physical performance metrics between adequate and reduced dietary magnesium. And these included oxygen uptake and peak heart rate during standardized submaximal exercise. These findings indicate that dietary magnesium depletion can be induced in otherwise healthy women. It results in increased energy needs and adversely affects cardiovascular function during submaximal work. This may also explain previous observations of increased energy costs during standardized exercise in physically active men and women considered to have reduced magnesium neutrature. And that brings us to the last of the big four electrolytes, calcium. A British study on the role of supplementary calcium in submaximal exercise and endurance performance was conducted at the University of Central Lancashire. 
In part one of the study, cyclists were given a gram of calcium per day for four weeks. The results indicated that calcium supplementation significantly improved body composition of the participants with a greater fat loss and increased lean mass observed in highly trained athletes as compared to the recreationally trained participants. And, in addition, four weeks of calcium supplementation also showed an enhanced trend of availability of fatty substrates in the plasma and consequently an increased trend towards higher fat oxidation during submaximal exercise. Recalling the importance of fat as an endurance energy source from parts 1 and 2, these increases to fat metabolism are of particular interest. So the study went on to conduct time trials for 10 and 25 mile events. The results were that power output with calcium supplementation rose by 2.7 and 4% respectively, with corresponding improvements in completion times. The results from this set of investigations indicate that calcium plays a multifactorial role in performance enhancement of endurance events. Okay, so after discussing electrolyte replacement from the perspective of what's at stake, so to speak, the question logically follows, how much should I take? Well, first of all, people can vary substantially in the saltiness of their sweat. This comprehensive review on the physiology of sweat gland function has a nice frequency histogram on sweat sodium concentrations in a population of individuals. And while you can see there's a pretty standard bell curve shape wherein most people do turn out to be average, there's a fairly broad range of possible outcomes. Part of the variation is due to inherent differences between people. Some folks just naturally have more salt in their sweat. Now, apart from actually getting yourself tested, I've read that an informal way to tell is by examining your workout clothes after you've sweat in them and then they've dried. If you can actually see white crystalline or powdery deposits in the armpits, for example, you may be on this saltier end of the world's sweaters. Dark colors work best for this test. But that's just an average. Each of us can vary significantly from our own baseline depending on the rate at which we're sweating. This graph depicts sweat sodium concentrations based on the different sweat rates resulting from various levels of exertion from 50 to 90 percent of maximal heart rate. And what you can see is that for a doubling of the sweat rate, there's not quite but getting near twice the concentration of sodium per liter of that sweat. Suppose in your normal routine you're used to replacing a liter of water and electrolyte loss with one of these. But if unusually hot weather on one of your hiking days doubles your typical sweat rate, you're not just making more sweat. Each liter of that sweat has gotten saltier. You'll need to supplement this with additional sodium and electrolytes. And don't just drink twice as many of these because you want the extra salts. Remember from part three on hydration that you should never drink more water than is lost. And in any event, not faster than one liter per hour. Okay, so like I do, I'm trying to move from abstract concepts like the reasons why you want to supplement with electrolytes to more practical issues such as how much of each type of electrolyte you might want to take. The table three shows the concentration in sweat for each of the big four electrolytes, sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. And the ranges on values are pretty wide because they reflect the full statistical spread shown in the histogram earlier. Still, they begin to form a picture of the ratios between each ingredient a recipe, if you will, for a potential electrolyte supplement. Because of all the variation possible, I wanted to get at least a few different versions of these ratios. So here's a look at the set referenced by Dr. Toker from his article on the math of salt loss. The target dose is listed per 250 milliliters of fluid, so double that if your frame of reference is in 16 ounce bottles. Here's another breakdown from a study published in the International Journal of Sport Nutrition and Exercise Metabolism. I normalized both to milligrams per half liter and then put them side by side. The sodium and potassium overlap in range, so there's decent agreement there. And about the best you can say about calcium and magnesium is that they're both trace components compared to the other two. And then let's go back to a source from the part three video, the Gatorade Sports Science Institute study, which was published in the European Journal of Applied Physiology. Remember that this study tested subjects at two levels of exertion, 65% VO2 max, which is about the level of a marathon run, and 45% VO2 max, which was our estimate for the aerobic intensity of hiking. And the results showed an average sweat sodium loss of 659 milligrams. And that was for 90 minutes though, so it would be about 435 milligrams per hour. 
Also from this study, the sweat rate for 45% VO2 max was about a half liter per hour. So you've got 435 milligrams of sodium per half liter of sweat. Now putting that up against the data Dr. Toker cited gives you something like this. The Gatorade study's sodium number fits nicely within the range listed. Now, applying the same ratios across the columns give you the following results for potassium, magnesium, and calcium. Now, obviously, I'm up to some of my fuzzy math tricks again, but given the research I can find, this serves as a decent baseline from which to plan your dietary electrolyte supplementation needs. Something to note, the Gatorade study was conducted at 86 degrees, which is a warm day. Sweat rates on cooler days would expectedly be lower. Now, apart from the performance-related issues just discussed, there's one more reason to keep your electrolytes up that may be of particular interest to the ultralighters out there concerned with water weight, and it goes to the actual efficiency of the water you drink. Now, what do I mean by the efficiency of water? Water's water. How can one liter be more or less efficient than another? It can't really. It's your body's efficiency at absorbing the water that is at stake. If you ask yourself, how many liters of water do I need to drink in order to replace three liters lost throughout the day? If your answer was three liters, you've implicitly assumed 100% absorptive efficiency. Safe to say, any assumption of perfect efficiency in real life is probably incorrect. The reality is you'll have to drink more water than you actually lost precisely because your system isn't 100% efficient. Some of the water you drink is wasted. That is, it passes through without being absorbed and therefore does not contribute to your rehydration. Realize that you're not an open sack of fluid. You don't just pour water into your stomach and say, that's it, I'm hydrated. The body is rather solidly filled with much, much smaller containers of fluid called cells. And when you drink something, that water has to laboriously pass through countless membranes in order to reach desired distribution. And as discussed at the beginning, the way that happens is through osmosis. Remember that sodium is the primary driver of fluid balance in the body. In order to pull water back into every nook and cranny of your big old self, it takes enough sodium. For every bottle of water swallowed, you only get so much absorbed into your system. The saltier you are, the more water you will be able to draw out of what you drank before it inevitably flows its way down the renal river to your urinary tract. Run low on sodium and every swallow nets you less system water than it would otherwise. And the result is that for every liter lost, you have to drink more than a liter to replace it. How much more depends upon how electrolytic you are. I found a study to give you an idea of what the real world consequences might be. This randomized controlled trial published in the Journal of Wilderness and Environmental Medicine studied 16 firefighters engaged in wildfire suppression. Participants were split into two groups. One drank plain water over the course of 15 hours. The other consumed water plus an electrolyte additive. The electrolyte plus water group drank 220 milliliters per hour less than the plain water group. That's a total of 3.3 liters less for the day. And both groups had no difference in urine-specific gravity. Think the color of your pee, recall from part three. So at the end of the day, the electrolyters were able to achieve essentially the same hydration status for 3.3 liters less. That's over seven pounds of water. And the study author's conclusion sums up the relevance for backpackers. Supplementing water with electrolytes can reduce the amount of fluid necessary to consume and transport during extended activity. And this can minimize carrying excessive weight, possibly reducing fatigue during extended exercise. Okay, so we're at that point, I think, that we reached in the hydration strategies video. We got a lot of good theory that lets us construct a series of guidelines, not rules really, but we need a way to be able to abide by these guidelines on the trail where there isn't access to fancy lab tests. For hydration status, my solution was to monitor urine frequency and color. It's field expedient and a somewhat validated metric. For electrolyte balance, I use this. It's a water retention meter. My wife got it for me as a wedding present. In fact, it's so important to her that she wants me to wear it all the time, even when we're not hiking. That's how much she cares. You see, one of the most common situations you're likely to encounter on the trail is exercise-associated hyponatremia. And that's where you may be replacing fluids as you go, but you aren't adequately keeping up with sodium loss. 
It's considered to be of particular concern during endurance exercise lasting several hours or more, especially when conducted in the heat, like hiking in the summer. A symptom of the onset of hyponatremia is swelling. And let's go back to our toys for an illustration of the effect. So here's your cell, and this is your extracellular space. And even though the amounts of sodium aren't the same on both sides, the ratio of waters to sodium is. The concentrations are balanced, so there's no net osmotic pressure one way or the other. Now, let's remove one helping of sweat from the extracellular space, which in this scheme was five waters to one sodium. Done. Then, you drink the water back. And then you sweat another round. And you drink the water back. See how, even though the total water content hasn't changed, sodium levels are down outside the cell. The ratio of waters to sodium has increased markedly. And remember that sodium is an osmotically active substance, meaning it will attract water across the cell membrane towards areas where the concentration is higher, which in this case is now inside the cell. So, we have to move some of these extra waters over here. Well, pumping that extra water into the cell is what causes the swelling. And it happens because of electrolyte imbalance, not because you're necessarily consuming too much water. And this swelling is commonly observed in the hands, legs, and feet. Here's an example of how it often works for me. Depending on what's for breakfast, I might be starting the day with a substantial amount of sodium. So when I hit the trail, it's plain water to begin. Mindful of the fact that drinking to thirst leads over a long enough period of time slowly into dehydration, I monitor my urine frequency and color to make sure I'm taking in adequate H2O. Remember, you want to stay less than 2% dehydrated in order to maintain optimal performance during your hike. But even though I may be drinking enough, over time, my hands and feet begin to swell. And that's an indication my sodium levels might be running low. And even better than my shoes feeling tight, I find the ring to be a remarkably sensitive instrument in this regard. It lets me detect the situation early, hopefully before all those performance degrading effects we talked about earlier. Snug fit, time to start taking on electrolytes with my water. But as long as the ring stays loosey-goosey, I don't worry about supplementing anything beyond what I'm already getting in the trail snacks that I eat along the way. And I really don't make it any harder on myself than that. Technically, between hydration and electrolytes, and being over, under, or about right in combinations of each, uh, you're looking at nine possible conditions to be in. And there's a nice article by Carl King, which originally appeared in the May 2007 issue of Ultra Running Magazine. It contains a table with all nine conditions, a description of the symptoms, causes, and advice on what to do about it. And not all of these conditions are equally likely. As Mr. King notes in the table, being both overhydrated and high in electrolytes is very rare. The cause listed is overconsumption of salt. Now, despite its rarity, this one seems to be an unusually strong concern for some people. I watch a lot of food videos, and if you go through the comments, in almost every single case, you can find at least one that runs along these lines. My biggest issue with these pre-packaged freeze-dried meals is the insane amount of sodium in them. For that very reason, I won't use them. Now, in fairness, this person might have a medical condition that requires limiting sodium intake, and in any event, no one can say such a position is wrong. By all means, you do you, but it's this kind of thing that wakes up the skeptic in me. For starters, what constitutes an insane amount of sodium, and how was that amount determined? Let's look at a classic dinner and one of my favorites, the beef stroganoff with noodles. If you eat the whole package for dinner, which I do, you're looking at 1,570 milligrams of sodium. To some, that sounds like a lot. It says right on the label that equates to 68% of your daily value, which is based on a recommended intake of 2,300 milligrams per day. Well, first of all, that doesn't by itself exceed any limit. You could still have 730 milligrams of additional sodium throughout the day and still not be over the DV. But more importantly, who says the recommended daily value applies to hikers? That value is just a baseline. It's for an average person on an average day. Trekking 15 to 30 miles up and down mountains with a pack isn't an average day. 
Depending on the weather and circumstances, your hike could boost sodium needs by thousands of milligrams per day. Just look again at the table referenced by Dr. Toker in his article on the math of salt loss. Note the upper limit on the performance daily intake for sodium. It's 4,500 milligrams, almost double the daily value for putting in eight hours at a desk job and watching Netflix at night. All of a sudden, that Mount House meal is only about 35% of your daily intake. If you ate three meals a day, you'd need those 1,500 milligrams of sodium in each and every one of them to make that target. And Dr. Toker puts it succinctly. As athletes are not typical in their nutrient needs, the national dietary guidelines established for average adults often do not apply to athletes, workers, soldiers, or other physically active individuals. Now, just to clarify, I know that sodium is a serious concern for some people. Depending on your medical condition, limiting your intake may be medically advisable. And I'm not even attempting to address lifestyle nutrition or general health issues. My research focused solely on the topic of supplementation during the conditions of a backpacking trip. The thing to keep in mind there is, an extraordinary amount of activity can require an extraordinary amount of resources and of those things consumed during such effort, electrolytes are as much a part as fuel and water. From the researchers who conducted the study on salt and performance during triathlete competition, sweat is from 40 to 60 milliequivalents per liter of sodium. Mineral water is about two. And while sports drinks are specifically designed to replace both fluid and electrolytes, even the best on the market only have a sodium concentration of around 20 milli equivalents per liter, approximately half of that lost through sweat. They go on to say that sports drink companies know that more sodium would be beneficial, but it becomes an issue of taste and marketability. In other words, the drinks would have to be too salty in order to be properly effective. No one would want to drink them and they wouldn't sell. The authors state for typical sports lasting less than two hours, such sports drinks may be adequate. But for extremely long events, like hiking all day, it may be necessary to eat food that contains high amounts of salt, such as fruits or nuts, or even salt capsules to reduce the effect of the loss of electrolytes on physical performance. One last take for a perspective on the sodium needs of those who exercise heavily. This article published in the August 2007 edition of Current Sports Medicine Reports discusses the importance of salt in the athlete's diet. Dr. Valentine goes over some practical applications and guidelines, one of which is the scenario of an athlete that performs for four hours with a sweat rate of one and a half liters per hour and a sodium concentration of 25 millimoles per liter. That works out to 3,500 milligrams of sodium lost. Not all day, but just during their performance. Now, that sweat rate is for high intensity training. Going back to our estimate for hiker level intensity, we had the study that showed 435 milligrams of sodium loss per hour, a lower rate of sodium loss than the athlete, but hikers perform for much, much longer. If you hiked for eight and a half hours like that, your sodium loss would be about 3,600 milligrams. Eat me. Or at the very least, don't be afraid of me. Okay, so far we've discussed some potential consequences of electrolyte imbalance, ways to assess your balance in the field, and an element of perspective on what your sodium needs might approach during a hike. Next, we should talk about where to get all those electrolytes from. Now, if you're just going for a run or playing around a sports ball, something like this is probably sufficient. But for events lasting from several hours to all day, you're going to be eating as you go. And that brings up the question, how many of my electrolyte needs can I satisfy with food? A simple question that spawns a lot of work. It prompted me to add sodium and potassium numbers for all 908 items listed in the food chart that I made available for download in previous videos. Or I should say, sodium numbers for all the items as only sodium is required by the FDA to be on food labels. And there's a spot for potassium and it's sometimes reported, but it's optional and so a lot of manufacturers don't list amounts, even if present in the food itself. And calcium and magnesium don't have spots on the food label proper. It's possible that various vitamins and minerals can be listed somewhere, but that tends to be rare and irregular. For fluid balance, sodium is the key player, making that the primary electrolyte of concern regarding hydration itself. It's also by far the electrolyte lost in greatest amounts in your sweat. 
and therefore the one you should be most concerned about replacing. It would be nice to know them all, but I had to work with what was available. So what I did was add two new columns to the chart showing amounts in milligrams for sodium and potassium if included. And that way, you've got the raw numbers to make any of your own conclusions as desired. But I also added another of my signature color-coded columns which ranks the sodium content visually using my patented method of science-based subjectivity. Here's the thinking behind the purple ranking scheme. The raw sodium amounts vary widely, in part because portion sizes vary widely. To normalize sodium amounts to a consistent amount of food, I calculated milligrams per calorie. And that way you can monitor your sodium consumption for each amount of food you eat, whether you choose to track it per snack, per meal, or per day. And the shades of purple represent tiers of total sodium intake based on a diet of 3,600 calories per day, which seems to be a decent average hiker loadout. I then used 2,300 milligrams of sodium as a baseline minimum for daily intake. It's the recommended daily allowance number, but remember that's for an average day and hiking is anything but average. Your sodium losses on the trail are expected to be significantly greater than this civilian average, so to speak. So, below this minimum, the milligrams per calorie number will appear white. And what that means is, if all the foods you ate in a day averaged at that number, you'd come in below 2300 milligrams of sodium for the day, based on a 3600 calorie diet. And that threshold, by the way, is 0 0.64. Above that minimum, the number is shaded light purple. The next threshold is set to a nice round 1.0. That's one milligram of sodium for every calorie or a daily 3,600 milligrams for the diet size in question. Remember, that's still comfortably in the middle of the performance daily intake range discussed earlier. And I'm not saying it's recommended for your everyday diet, but it's actually a fairly conservative estimate for a whole day's hiking. Consider it's just 1,300 milligrams over the daily recommended allowance for when you're not being particularly active. Well, if you were to sweat at our hiker's intensity level, losing 435 milligrams of sodium per hour, all you have to do is sweat for a mere three hours to need that 1300 milligrams extra. It seems reasonable to me, but again, the numbers are there for you to make your own judgments. Above a milligram per calorie, the colors go to medium purple. 1.25 milligrams per calorie is the amount at which a 3600 calorie diet would yield 4500 milligrams total. And since that was the upper limit given for the performance daily intake, that's the level at which purple shading goes dark. There's a link provided in the description box below. Download this latest version of the chart to peruse the saltiness of all your favorite foods and see those numbers directly alongside all the other data like calorie density, carb protein ratio, and fat and sugar percentages. For explanations and discussion of those analysis columns, see parts one and two of this video series. Obviously, the salt content of the various foods listed will vary widely. Not everything you pack is likely to have the same color rating. You may find that many of your favorite snacks run low on vital sodium, so you'll end up looking for ways to supplement with saltier foods. Or, you are concerned about daily total intake and want to find lower sodium options to balance out the high content, for example, in your favorite freeze-dried meal, which you just can't do without. Whatever your goals, the chart can help. And as always, the value in a bird's eye view of the dietary landscape is the surprises that perspective brings. For instance, it's probably no shocker that jerky has a relatively high sodium content. But get a load of bread. It's almost universally dark purple. A single restaurant style tortilla has almost a thousand milligrams of sodium. If you ate just two tortillas for dinner, plain, with nothing on them, you'd have hundreds of milligrams more sodium than from this mountain house meal that shocks some people's conscience. And how about the side dishes I see so many hikers talking about? Those Idahoan mashed potatoes in your bag have got a higher sodium content per calorie than some brands of beef jerky. Now, I'm not saying any particular product or any individual level of sodium is either good or bad. I suppose I'm just telling you on the reasons why perusing the chart could be to your benefit. Intuition isn't always sufficient when it comes to gauging sodium content in foods. Set your own goals, and these numbers can help you properly achieve it. And remember, as far as your daily diet goes, it's an average. There's no need to shy away from any item you like because it's either too high or too low for the standard you've set. By having a mixed diet, 
every bit of dark purple can be offset with a bite of white. At the end of the day, it's the overall balance that matters. To that end, don't despair if many of your favorite things come in a shade darker than you're comfortable with. Some of the tastiest, highest density foods on the list are actually quite low in their sodium per calorie rating. Nut butters are almost all rated white, and there are a bunch of ultralight options, some are even hyperlight. And don't forget your candy. Dark chocolate is caloric gold and very low in sodium. So good sodium balance and high calorie density can be had simultaneously. Just scrutinize your menu a bit. And since you'll have to be eating as you go, food makes an obvious and convenient source for replenishing lost electrolytes. But I'd be remiss if I didn't mention another obvious way. Supplements. Seems like a no-brainer, right? Why not just go there first? Well, as stated, you have to eat anyway, and we've seen how there's no shortage of sodium available on a lot of the foods that hikers say they eat the most. So all of a sudden the question almost becomes, why bother with supplements at all? In two words, fine tuning. The electrolytes in food are inseparable from their calories. You could pour over the food chart for days looking to optimize your carb protein ratios, then try to factor in the fat and sugar content, all while simultaneously trying to keep the highest calorie density possible. The problem can start to seem like solving Rubik's menu. Now you're supposed to add another side to the cube with sodium? And my approach is to not make it harder on myself than I have to. Here's a menu of what I'll actually eat in a day on the trail. Everything comes right off the chart, with the whole day's totals shown across the bottom. All of the items were chosen for their nutritional performance ratings with calorie density in mind. And recall from the optimal trail fuel video that protein heavy things like peanut butter or meat sticks can be combined with carb heavy pastry items to make one snack that has an overall optimum ratio. I didn't consider sodium at all in the selection process. And as it turns out, I'm consuming just over 3,200 milligrams per day with this diet. And what I can tell you from experience is, regardless of whether 3,200 milligrams sounds like a lot, it's not enough. And that's where supplements come in. You see, I like what I eat. It's an effective fuel that I feel good hiking on and it tastes well. So I'm not interested in swapping out an almond butter filled cinnamon cookie sandwich with more meat sticks just to get the extra sodium. It's hard enough to get all of the other criteria to align. As long as your preferred menu comes in at least a little bit lower than you'll typically need, just use electrolyte supplements to make up the difference, as needed. And that's a key point, as needed. It's not just about how flexible you are in what you eat, it's also about the fact that sodium needs can vary greatly from one day to the next. You might start out trekking across a hot lowland in the full sun but then be shrouded in clouds and cold rain or snow when you climb into the mountains on day two. Or the weather can simply turn out to be markedly different than was forecast. Dramatically different amounts of sweating will create dramatically different replacement needs. It's virtually impossible to be that flexible with your sodium intake when every milligram is tied to some calorie or other. The only practical way I've found to maintain the required flexibility with sodium intake is to have a good baseline through food and then take on whatever extra becomes necessary through the use of dedicated electrolyte replacement products. So let's take a look at just a few of the many, many options available. The most obvious choice, I suppose, would be the good old sports drink. But for carry purposes, I'd imagine you want the powder packets instead. But these are heavy compared to your many fattier options of things to eat. And for that reason, I personally reserve the sugared formulas for my recovery mix. So when a sweaty day calls for more sodium than my food is providing, I go with a dedicated electrolyte supplement. Now I avoid the liquids. They're harder to measure, easier to spill, might leak in your pack. And these have way too little sodium to match the profile in your sweat. Powders seem to be the most practical solution for the trail. And Gatorade has an endurance line for those with the highest replacement needs. It includes their Gator Lights. There's more than one and a half times as much sodium in this little packet as there is in this entire bottle. And remember, our good doctor explained to us that they know there's not enough in these drinks for long-term endurance events. You'll need extra. And these packets are lightweight, compact, pretty durable, and potent. They do, however, still require you to mix without spilling, have a container dedicated to supplemented water, and the packaging creates waste to deal with. In a perfect world, I'd like not just sodium and potassium, 
but all four major electrolytes. I want it separate from calories so I can fine-tune my needs to account for variable conditions without worrying about upending my oh-so-carefully-built performance menu. And I want it all in a format that's easy to carry, easy to take, with no mixing, messing, or waste. No compromise, no problem. Everything you asked for and nothing you didn't. For me, these capsules check all the boxes. Design your own menu around lightweight performance nutrition. Don't worry about being too low in sodium. Don't worry about trying to predict how much you might sweat ahead of time. Just go hiking and eat as you would. Then, on any given day, at any given hour, if and when your hydration band suggests it, take a supplement. And in case anybody's wondering, I'm not affiliated with any product or any person. I receive nothing for valuation, not for free or discount, no offers or deals of any kind whatsoever. These are just the easiest, most effective, lightest weight, and most flexible solution I've found to the problem. As mentioned, I do still use Gatorade and Tailwind packets for my recovery drinks. As far as the ratios of sodium to potassium to calcium and magnesium goes, SaltStick has a graphic on their site comparing sweat losses to the ingredients in a variety of commercial electrolyte supplements. And then lastly, I wanted to touch on a somewhat different but related family of products known as oral rehydration salts. Under normal, albeit sweaty, conditions, you may be losing large amounts of sodium and therefore need to take in large amounts in order to stay balanced. But you're not in any particular medical distress while that's going on. It's just a standard expend and consume scenario, same as with the water you're evaporating and the calories you were burning. However, what if something were to go wrong? A risk in the backcountry is bad water, and a consequence of bad water is diarrhea. If severe enough, the resulting dehydration can be deadly. Millions of people in developing countries lose their lives this way every year. So the World Health Organization has studied the problem of emergency rehydration extensively. You see, it's not just dehydration that's a problem with severe diarrhea. One of the complications also involves electrolyte imbalance. A healthy individual secretes 2,000 to 3,000 milligrams of sodium per day into the intestinal lumen. Nearly all of this is reabsorbed so that sodium levels in the body remain constant. In a diarrheal illness, sodium-rich intestinal secretions are lost before they can be reabsorbed, and this can lead to a life-threatening hyponatremia within hours. When things get this bad, you shouldn't just rely on normal food and water, or even conventional drink mixes. Studies indicate that the WHO formula for ORS may lower the mortality rate from diarrhea by as much as 93%. Years ago, the formula was revised to provide even better results. In a hospital setting, they just hook you up to a drip and wait for you to get better. The new reduced osmolarity oral rehydration solution was associated with fewer unscheduled intravenous infusions compared with standard WHO rehydration solution. And that's a valuable benefit when you may be treating yourself or another patient in the backcountry more than a day away from civilization. Essentially, there's a protein involved in the transport of sodium across the cell membranes in the intestines. And this protein is what's known as a symporter. That is to say, it's a co-transporter of two substances in the same direction at the same time. In addition to sodium, that other substance is glucose. Two sodium ions are taken across with each molecule of glucose. And as it turns out, the process is most efficient when the solution is mixed in this specific ratio. For each cycle of the transport, hundreds of water molecules move into the epithelial cell, slowly rehydrating the patient. Not only does the sodium to sugar ratio need to be tuned correctly, but the osmolarity of the solution as a whole needs to be on point as well. And that means you'll also want to mix your powder with approximately the correct amount of water. And this ORS packet from EGS Brands contains the Who's new reduced osmolarity formula and is conveniently dosed to mix with one liter of water. And be careful about lookalikes on Amazon that may contain the old, less effective formula. The good ones can be had in these packs from Adventure Medical Kits. Just a few other available mixes in this category if you prefer. Cerolite has been around for a while. I see it offered on a lot of medical supply websites. It also mixes in one liter of water. It seems kind of bulky though compared to these. The hydrolyte packets are tiny, but they only mix with 200 milliliters of water, so it would take five of these to make 
one of these. And then there's Liquid IV, which labels itself a hydration multiplier and talks about its cellular transport technology. And they mix in a common 16 ounce bottle of water. Now, remember, these are more for emergencies than regular hydration. They require a specific formula to work properly. The trace amount of sugar present isn't enough to supply your energy needs while hiking, and the presence of other calories will throw their ratios off. And these are more for treatment if things go really wrong. I keep a couple in my first aid kit. And that's the show, folks. In summary, electrolytes, in particular sodium, are a case of balance. While many worry about too much, too little is actually the more common problem with endurance athletes. Hypernatremia is most likely the result of dehydration, not overconsumption of salt. And hyponatremia is the result of treating dehydration with water and not enough sodium. Failure to replace lost electrolytes doesn't just affect water balance. It also affects muscle contraction, cardiac function, and energy metabolism. And it does so in ways that can measurably impact your physical performance on the trail. Learn to recognize the symptoms of water and electrolyte imbalance so you can properly diagnose and treat your needs in the field. And recognize that the recommended daily allowance guidelines are for average circumstances, which likely do not apply to your hiking experience. Your sodium needs on the trail could very realistically be thousands of milligrams higher than for a usual day at home. And therefore, expect to need significant supplementation in order to maintain performance in the field. Use the updated food chart to help you plan your menu. And carry your electrolyte mix of choice to supplement during the times when your needs exceed that which is supplied by diet alone. And lastly, consider carrying a packet of emergency rehydration salts for first aid in the event that something goes really wrong. As always, thanks for watching, and I very much appreciate your time.